Well, hi. We're back here with another... Oh, no, not really. It's a new retro review live on the DST show. Of course, we are going over one of the worst WrestleManias I've practically ever watched next to 27. I'm not going to be like, oh, I watched Mania... Mania 2000, or I watched me. Well, I did watch Mania 25. Uh, yeah, but over most of it, nothing has really shown the decline of quality for for WWE, other than the standpoint of of 2016. By a landslide, there hasn't been a good episode I think I've watched of even Monday Night Raw since I think I when Shane came back after Fastlane or the Royal Rumble. And everybody was so hyped because SmackDown was like above average for like a few. All SmackDown was was better than Raw quality wise and time wise. Other than that, I thought SmackDown back then was just mediocre but better than Raw. And the fixation of pushing mid carters that were barely even getting good press mainstream wise, other than the time when Goldberg returned on Raw. I think what like late October. 2016 to push Goldberg and Lesnar. Like, there is no semblance of the brand split, and this was the last non-brand split WrestleMania until 20, until Mania 33. The main event was predictable as such to over-push Roman Reigns over for the main event of Mania 32. The only reason was they wanted it either to be Rollins or Ambrose, but there was, like, a huge mishmash of injuries over that standpoint for 2015 and 16. Neville, Wade Barrett, Sheamus, John Cena, Seth Rollins were out for Mania. Giving out such a lackluster card. This is when the League of Jobbers, the, the social outcast of Jobbers, were pushing away airtime. We opened with a freaking Intercontinental title ladder match. This is, was the second time they did an Intercontinental Championship ladder match, man. And I, and I thought this was going to be a thing because, of course, they stopped doing the Money in the Bank ladder match, even though people had no complaints. I think the only complaint that they had over the match was, like, the Money in the Bank briefcase winners, because the matches were entertaining as hell. Like, who doesn't remember Mania 24's ladder Money in the Bank ladder match? Mania 20... Like, every ladder match was a memorable highlight of Mania, and it was a constant staple over the past... Let's say five years. So, like, they started doing these ladder matches for the IC title, I guess to give it up, give it over prestige. And over the time when the IC title was in decent direction of being a secondary championship to go for, it was Zach, it was uh, Kevin Owens feuding with Dean Ambrose over the standpoint of it. The Miz, Sin Cara, Cody Rhodes, I mean, Stardust, oh my god, Stardust was the worst thing that happened in Cody's career, oh my god, the, mm, the Cody, the American Nightmare, kill me, Dolph Ziggler, and Zack Ryder, Zack Ryder won it, the match was decent and it was average enough, Sin Cara barely botched a spot, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn kept killing each other, over doing ex exploder suplexes over and killing, breaking their necks over most of the most of the spots. Then we had Stardust pulling up a dusty, glitterized ladder. Like, that was the only highlight of the night. I think he got tossed with it. Tossed with it outside in the ring. And Zack Ryder, after having a ch uh, change of blows with the Miz, he takes the, he takes the title, he takes the Intercontinental Championship. And you know how long? How long was it? Only a day before he loses it. Only a day. That, that's the only thing. That, that It's only been a day. He he lost it the next night on Raw after Miz challenged for a rematch after insulting that he's not a fighting champion. Like, that's the constant word people put now for forcible babyfaces to make sure they have no other character other than, oh, you're a babyface? You're a fighting champion. If you're a heel, oh, I, I'm going to face it in my time on, pap on pay-per-view. Like, oh, it's so predictable and it's so bland. Then we got... AJ Styles versus Chris Jericho, and these guys traded wins on 
since Fastlane, since Jericho debuted. I remember this thoroughly because uh, it feels like it was freaking yesterday. And Jericho lost against Styles in his de pay-per-view debut on Fastlane over in February. Then Jericho beat Jack Swagger at Roadblock to hype up the, pe the pay-per-view match. Yeah, that was when Roadblock first started. They had a small stint as a tag, tag team. I think it was called Y2AJ. Then uh, Jericho tossed it in the bin and just quickly turned heel on an episode of SmackDown. So, literally, it was built over from that. I guess because he's like, I built the foundation, stuff like that. I mean, the matches with Jericho and Styles were good. Like, the Fastlane match, I remember being pretty nice. Because uh, not a lot of people seen Styles before, and his moveset was pretty cool. Reverse DDT, I think there was a couple of botches over with the walls of Jericho. Uh, cool drag spots. I like that little running arm drag thing he used to do all the time. Phenomenal forearm. It was, he was trying to go for the phenomenal forearm again, but he got hit with a code breaker. So Jericho at least picked up the win. Who at least make Jericho look competent and pick up the win on WrestleMania, so I guess it's bigger. I don't think they feuded afterwards. I think after, I don't know what came after, after WrestleMania. I think it was either Payback or Extreme Rules. They had one more match. Then Jericho started feuding with Dean Ambrose in the goddamn flower pot. That was in the Ambrose Asylum match. Ambrose in Asylum. Remember, Ambrose is crazy. Ambrose is crazy, guys. Oh, man, dude. And the, you know how long this pay-per-view was? A mere over four hours. They kept hyping it over. Oh, Mania. Uh, our people won't even remember what Mania is is because they didn't even put up a numeron. Like, if you're going to put numeric numbers on it, I'd rather you do that than just do absolutely nothing. Like, you don't even put on the giant star thing. Oh, this is the 32nd WrestleMania. It doesn't feel iconic. It doesn't feel authentic. It just feels like, oh, it's just a WrestleMania, but we're in Texas. Like, you take it, you take it like we haven't been in Texas before for Mania. And we haven't been in Texas since, I think, the Astrodome back at Mania 17, 2001. And how sad we are back at Texas, but I think we were in, cow in the Cowboys place. Like, a bigger capacity. And yet, they still had to fabricate attendance. Sorry, I'm eating celery. Then we had the New Day face-off against the League of Jobbers. The match was so goddamn forgettable, dude. I think there was just some spots. Uh, I think the League of Nation picked up the victory. The, the only highlight of the show, highlight of the match, was literally the New Day's entrance coming up dressed like the freaking Genyu Force. With Dragon Ball Z attire, come with a falling cereal box, and that was technically it. New Day somehow lost, but then the 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 hometown Hall of Famers come, like Steve Austin, with freaking beer belly, wearing wristbands for some apparent reason. Michaels wearing his gear for some apparent reason. Mick Foley, just like Mick Foley, and they all do their finishers and celebrate. Stun Xavier was thus technically it, like. You come off losing, and then... I don't think the tag titles were even on the line. I didn't even know why they were feuding for that long. And then, after Mania, they started just dissenting and then imploding. League of Nations just was over. Alberto went to jail. Wade Barrett had some bad news and got released. Sheamus was the te technically the only person who stood by, and later that year, he tagged with uh, Cesaro after their Best of Seven series. Ah, uh, and Rusev. Poor Rusev. I mean, at least he was back in the title scene. He was feeding with Roman Reigns later in the year. And uh, I think he had a capture the flag match. Was uh, no, he did not. That was the next year. Like, uh, there was also, I think, a moment, a segment involving the White family. And them saying, oh, I'm sco sco scoopy. I I'm scary. I don't know what the hell Scoopy is. Uh, I'm scary. Sc scary. And you all... Like, he didn't... He wasn't booked over a match, and that's disappointing. He's the same guy who just wrestled The Undertaker in the previous year. Why is he not booked? Then he comes over with The Rock and John Cena coming around saying that they're inbred neckbeard weirdos. 
and then you come around just squat, just burying the whole Wyatt family. And I thought it was a potential thing because I used to be intimidated a bit back then when the Wyatt family first showed up on television. Like you have a cult gimmick with a prolific good talker that that is shockingly athletic for a guy his look, and he can beat the crap out of it. He intimidated guys like over John Cena. I had some memorable moments with the with the with the shield, and then he comes around getting buried at Mania in a non. Oh God, that's so bad. I just felt like this was absolutely disappointing. The other thing that happened was, of course, Dean Ambrose and Brock Lesnar in a street fight. Dude, I rem dude, I remember this pretty non fondly, like the opposite of fondly. So, of course, Brock Le they kept hyping over, uh, Brock Lesnar's gonna tear you apart. You look at you, and look at Brock Lesnar. He can literally turn you into a toothpick because you were built like a crack fiend. And this is, like, the time when Dean Ambrose, like, lost potential to be, like, seen as a main eventer. Other than, I guess, 2014 to, like, mid early 2015, when people were like, oh, this guy, I could see him in the main event scene. He's a cool, roguish guy out of the shield. Cool move set, always seemed to be like the more fun guy to have around. Even though, like he was at least two of the second person next to Roman that you could see on the Shield to be a main eventer, but no, Rollins cashed in at Mania and became world champion. So, yeah. Then he started having these feuds over with Rollins, never winning the title. He steals it. I mean, he did win the world championship at Money in the Bank, but like it became more bland because they had the brand split. Making sure he didn't have as much uh, legitimacy because it made sure that the world title is like the secondary choice belt, especially on SmackDown. And he was feuding with Dolph Ziggler, so it made it feel unimportant and less desired. Uh, so the match he had with Lesnar had him, uh, they kept typing him over as this rip-off hardcore rookie. Like they had Terry Funk and Mick Foley give him Barbie and a chainsaw. And it's like, oh, he brought the chainsaw. He brought the chainsaw and the and Barbie. He comes around getting the German suplex, and it's like we know that they're not going gory for this match. I remember podcasts and stuff going all over the internet, like, oh, this is gonna be crazy. No, the best thing he was hit he, German suplex on a pile of steel chairs, and then I think he got F five clothesline around the place. Like Ambrose was barely putting up uh, much of the fight, even though he kept trying to chair shoot shot him. Lesnar was like. Absolutely getting beaten the shit out of it, it just felt like dude The the kendo sticks it, it was not doing much and we knew it was one-sided because there's no realistic way Ambrose was gonna get over Off this it just felt so devalued just to put him on mania just to have him get destroyed by Lesnar We also had Charlotte Flair Versus remember this is like near five hours of television of pay-per-view we had a triple threat match for the women's championship. Yes, they returned. They wanted to. This was the era, the continuing era of the women's evolution, or the divas' evolution. I don't care which. You can say down in the comment section when I care. So Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and Sasha Banks, the four horsewomen. Uh, Charlotte was already, I think, one of the longest reigning divas champions over the standpoint. And then they changed it to the women. Back to the women's title, so I guess that was the only uh, complacent positive, because people were complaining about the title and saying that the women were finally looking legit. The match was at least one of the better ones of the night. I remember that corkscrew moonsault Charlotte did over the top, the the sexual harassment that Ric Flair did over to Becky Lynch, and trying to distract them, the top uh, running suicide dive over by Sasha Banks. I think it still ended with Charlotte. Was Charlotte picking up the victory? Or Sasha? Yeah, it was Charlotte. The match was pretty alright. I thought it was too sloppy and they were just moving over to the high spot to give any highlights. The fans always felt dead in the, in the middle of the show. Uh, then we have, of course, Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match. Now, the story into this... Shane was finally returning over to the company, talking about how shit Raw has been for a majority of uh, its life cycle, losing, losing most of its viewership. He literally complained about the ratings, and I think WWE 
had to censor that in a, in, in a network when it came in the network that he talked about the declining ratings. Even though TV shows talked about that before because a certain authority figure is ruining the show or a wrestler ruining the ratings because they're not that good. So I don't know why they were trying to censor it because they know it's true and they were like near nearing one's territory at like late 2015. Other than that spike they had, I think, in the final episode of 2015 when Roman became WWE Champion against Sheamus. Other than that, Is if Undertaker wins, he keeps the streak. Technically, no, he doesn't keep the streak, but still he wins. But if Shane wins, he uh, becomes the owner of Raw. And it's like, why not the owner of the WWE? Like, a new direction of a storyline of Shane trying to take over the company would be nice. It would be up to a new direction other than the authority that's been shoved down her throat for the last two to three years at that point. So, it would be nice. Nothing's wrong with uh, trying to do a power story, a, a, str a power struggle storyline. It just needs to be done definitively, and Shane was in the point of like, oh, finally something new. So, I didn't mind. I just thought, oh no, he's trying to tease over the brand split. And they did. After payback, though. I think the draft happened after the Battleground pay-per-view. And I thought it was so stupid. There was a couple sleeper sleeper hold spots. Shane McMahon trying to do a triangle leg lock. I think it went sluggishly. There was a power bomb over the steel steps and the choke slam. Shane kept trying to overpower his way on the outside, and then the elbow dropped from the top of the, from the hell in a cell, making Michael Cole literally read his lines off the paper when he was trying to get out the commentary table. For the love of mankind, John, kill me! <laughs> uh, so, the match ended with Undertaker respecting Shane McMahon and hitting him with another Tombstone pile driver, or I think it was a choke slam. Picks up the victory, Shane does not have... He, never mind. Oh, out of respect for Vince McMahon, now he has responsibility of Monday Night Raw. Why specifically Monday Night Raw and not like the whole company? Don't know why. That's such a minimalist thing. That's like having a union for a local business and you say you just want to be, I just want my job back as produce. What? It's so dumb. Or you just want to be a cashier, or you want to, like, or just a specific position. Just so dumb. Uh, we also had the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I forgot who won this one. I think it was Big Show this time. Shaquille O'Neal was in this. I think many people nearly got injured. Especially Damian Sandow that I forgot was still working over in the company. Adam Rose, Baron Corbin was make his debut on the main roster. And then had this, this stupid feud with Dolph Ziggler for like the next two months. Two to three months, I think. And then Kane would show up. But then, Big Show would win getting, I think, Cesaro out from Payback back at Mania 30. So, uh, yeah. I'm kidding, K Corbin. Corbin won. Corbin won. He eliminated Kane last. I'm talking about Mania 31. Sorry, guys. Ah. Uh, so, we're up to our main event of the evening. Triple H against Roman Reigns for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. That was, like, their best name. They couldn't call it the Undisputed WWE Championship again, or they couldn't just call it WWE Championship. I don't know why. But uh, it was a bit hard to keep a mouthful like that for one belt. So, Triple H was on this month-long feud, or like this month-long feud with Roman Reigns, like keeping him away from the world title, disrespecting the authority, Roman. Uh, I want Finn Balor to be WWE Champion, not you. Rollins is out, out, out from that time because he suffered a uh, injury a uh, multi-month injury over his ankle after a sunset flip powerbomb went wrong before Survivor Series when he was supposed to actually face Roman Reigns 
on the pay-per-view. Then they had a whole a huge tournament involving uh, some of the top guys that were not injured at that point. So the real Cesaro, Ziggler, I think the Miz, Dean Ambrose, De uh, Kevin Owens, and Roman won the whole bit thing. Won the WWE Championship for the first time. Then Sheamus, Sheamus like cashed in. And then the hot potato of the bet over December that Roman won it back at the TLC pay-per-view. Dude, it was just so bad. Then, I think the coolest thing happened, because I think I haven't seen this before, even though I heard of it, I studied enough to know back at, like, I think in the early 90s, the WWE Championship was vacant. It put in the title defense. So... When Roman won back the WWE title, the final episode of 2015, Vince McMahon thought it would be a great idea for his title defense to defend it at the Royal Rumble. And he would be the obvious uh, number one spot. The match was fine. If you liked Roman just resting out earlier in the show, then everybody dragging out. People wanted Ambrose to win. The biggest thing that happened was Styles making his return. Roman, a Triple H was shockingly come at the number 30 spot and nearly eat, chewing out everybody. Roman Reigns would come back, he eliminated him. Literally give him the repeated suck it, suck it, suck it. It was so funny. And Triple H won. And then they dragged it over with him beating jobbers until Roman Reigns fought back with their crappy brawls with, with uh, shoddy, with shoddy uh, cuts, cuts by Roman. And now they're feuding. That's literally the sell, because they obviously knew they need, need somebody main event worthy. So I understood the standpoint. It was just the way they poor, poorly booked this. Could have been a bit better, in my opinion. Because I know they would obviously try to do the, the... I think the original plans was supposedly a shield triple threat match for Mania. Because Ambrose was busy with Lesnar. And Rollins was out with an injury, so they had to do what they had to do what they had to do and let Triple H get let Roman over. The sad thing is, it wasn't as good as the Lesnar and Roman match from last year. Huh. It was cool to see Stephanie get hit by a table, though. Spear over from the barricade. Then it was just a bunch of punch kick, punch kicks. Samoan dropped the spine buster. It just felt so bland because you know they were going to kick out of finishers all over the place until Roman finally got that spear and won the WWE World Heavyweight Championship medal. Yeah, that's practically the whole gosh dang show. I wish I would be more enthusiastic, but this is technically how I had to put it for you to understand how much I was really not that keen over going back to the show, but I wanted to do a bit of a retro review for you because, uh... Yeah, this is like over the standpoint of WWE lacking over quality and making their shows last for way too long because they think only wrestling matters now and lack of story progression, life, uh, long build, and cool characters can't even sell over a show anymore. And it's so mediocre that we now allow, we can now tolerate a two day event of Mania when we could barely even stand watching a four hour pay per view from. From the year of 2016 to now. I mean now. Many, now pay-per-views are a bit more consumable. Uh, technically because of the. COVID kind of. Lessening the amount of capacity. You can keep in the building. So WWE has to work what they have to have. And some of the pay-per-views have been. Pretty watchable now. So I can say that for a standpoint. I know I'm not going to enjoy Mania. That's all I'm going to say. But uh. Yeah, if you guys liked the review, how you felt about WrestleMania 32? You thought it was good? You thought it was bad? You had any fond memories? Or any other information that possibly nobody else knows? Please comment down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. That is it for the DST Show.